This is Planet Earth, and we are Family Search. Wait, who's Family Search? Family Search is a free, worldwide family connecting service that is driven 100% by people. We help you discover family across generations. Angelo is one of literally countless archivists or records custodians from around the world. These records might be names and dates and certificates, but they also might be photos and stories. At Family Search, a primary focus is obtaining records so we can make them available to you. But having all these records is only as valuable as your ability to easily search them to find your family connections. That's why tens of thousands of volunteers throughout the world are working literally around the clock, helping to verify computer automated indexing. Thanks to all of them, Family Search has over 16.8 billion searchable names and images. Join your family on Family Search today. Welcome to our second webinar of our International Archives Week. Uh, first, uh, thank you very much for, for joining us uh, today. Um, and thank you to the section of uh, Archives and Human Rights uh, of ICA uh, for proposing this, uh, this webinar during the International Archives Week. Actually, this is the, uh, a continuation of uh, of a program called Tuesday Talks, that is the, the webinars organized by the section um, every two months. Um, and first, uh, I would like to, inv to invite you to, to participate in this webinar through your questions. We will have a discussion at the end of the presentation. So there is a, a button on the bottom of, <laughs> a button of the bot on the bottom of the, of your screen uh, for questions and answers. Uh, so please use it to, to, to send uh, your questions. Um, this is a very special uh, webinar, uh, and this is a spe very special International Archives Week uh, for two reasons. Uh, first, uh, this year is the 75th anniversary of ICA. Uh, you, you may know that in 1948, it, um, ICA was created uh, with the support uh, of UNESCO at a, at a moment that UNESCO was supporting the creation of different associations for the safeguarding of, uh, of cultural or documentary heritage. And since then, ICA has helped to strengthen uh, the profession, has supported the development of, of archives and the development of the profession, especially. and. It has uh, become in, uh, became uh, uh, an international forum uh, of archivists and the most uh, the, the most important, I would say, uh, international forum for our profession. Um, then the second reason is because it's the 20 years anniversary uh, of the section of archives and human rights, uh, which started as a working group um, in 2003. Uh, during the uh, CITRA conference in, in Cape Town. We will talk about this, uh, about this uh, today. And today we have more than 130 members uh, who are part of this section. And I must say that this, this is one of our most active se uh, se uh, sections of, of ICA and developing um, uh, very important programs, being very active, like following up what is happening around the world and of course, creating a, a network of archivists around uh, this topic. Um, so today we will discuss about all these. First, um, I should uh, excuse uh, our president, Jose Kirps. Um, unfortunately, she cannot uh, accompany us today, but she sent uh, her regrets and she wishes uh, all of us uh, a very successful uh, webinar that I'm sure we will have with all these uh, important guests that we have today. Some of you already know them. Uh, they are very well recognized in the in the um, uh, archival sector, but also in relation to archives and human rights. Um, so we will discuss about different topics. First, we will watch uh, a video sent by Graham Domini talking about a little bit about the first step of, of the section and the creation of the working group uh, and this conference that we had in, in 2003. 
Then we have uh, through the host camp, host camp uh, I will introduce all of them uh, properly when uh, later, but she will talk a little bit about the evolution of this concept of archives and human rights, especially in relation to the fight uh, against impunity uh, through commissions and, and transitional justice. And then we will hear uh, to Antonio Quintana, we'll listen to Antonio Quintana, who will tell us a little bit about the old, current, and future uh, challenges uh, of archives in relation to the accountability uh, of business, children's rights, um, the rights of refugees, and all these topics that are very, like, very much important, uh, especially in contemporary society. And with me, um, I'm accompanied by Perrine Canavaggio. Um, she's a French archivist, but most importantly, she was one of the founder members uh, of the section of the working group uh, in 2003. And she was the, the, the first president of, uh, uh, of, the, of the working group until 2008, if I'm not wrong. Um, and right now, she is the coordinator or the responsible of all these uh, webinars and Tuesday talks that, that I just mentioned. Um, so to, to start, we will watch the, um, the video of uh, sent by Graham Domini. Um, Graham Domini was the, first, the, the National Archivist of South Africa from 2001 and 2014. And he was, that's very important, he was responsible for the archiving of the records of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa. And she will talk about this is because he, ho he hosted the 2003 uh, CITRA conference on archives and human rights in Cape Town. That was the place where this section was born. So we can start watching this video. Greetings, ICA colleagues. Thank you for honoring me with this uh, invitation to talk at the uh, 20th anniversary celebration of the 2003 Cape Town Citra Conference and the establishment of human rights as an important section of the ICA. Um, the 2001-2003 through 2003 cycle, uh, the thematic cycle of the ICA, uh, of CITRA, was the relationship between archivists and the broader society. And the Cape Town CITRA in 2003 was the final in that cycle, and it had the most important, I think, uh, most profound topic that of archives and human rights. It was an appropriate venue to hold this, um, uh, this important gathering and to discuss this vital issue. South Africa had only recently, nine years earlier, held its first democratic elections and had only about three years before that included the work of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, a great investigation into all the human rights violations during the apartheid era. So in, in um, framing the conference and discussing what needed to be uh, presented to delegates and how to do it, there was no better choice as a keynote speaker than Archbishop Emeritus Desmond Tutu, previously the Archbishop of Cape Town in the Anglican Church of South Africa. He was the chair of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. He was a Nobel Peace Laureate, and he had been a thorn in the side of the apartheid government for many, many years. The decision to have this um, topic as our main theme was endorsed not only by South Africa, the South African National Archives and the South African government, but by the Isabika member countries as well. And Isabika supported 
and participated in and co-hosted the conference in many different ways. One of the other outcomes related very closely to the theme Archives and Human Rights was a conference of ministers responsible for archives in the various Isabika countries. It was the first time that they'd come together in significant numbers. We had 12 of them. And they endorsed a document uh, on archives and good governance which included archives and human rights, and was subsequently adopted by NEPAD, the New Partnership for African Development, which was the engine for President Thabo Mbeki's vision of the African Renaissance. So we tried to foreground archives right at the middle of um, international and continental uh, chief policy issues. The introductory speech by Archbishop Tutu, I think I'm correct in saying, received the first standing ovation of any address by any keynote speaker at a Citra conference. Um, in addition to that, and in addition to all the discussions that were held in plenaries and in breakaway sessions, the delegates were taken to various sites around Cape Town which um, embodied the struggle against apartheid and the struggle for human rights. These included, of course, the iconic Robben Island prison, now a world heritage site, where President Mandela, a number of his colleagues, Robert Sabukwe from the Pan-Africanist Congre uh, Congress, etc., had been held prisoner for decades at a time. Uh, we also visited District 6, which was a barren wasteland where the so-called colored community of Cape Town, from where they had been evicted and their homes demolished, one of apartheid's most appalling human rights violations that we could see, and their little museum where the history of that dispossession was documented. Um, I think Many other speakers will talk of the establishment of the um, Archives and Human Rights Group, special interest section, and the hard work that went into it. But I particularly would like to thank my colleagues who worked with me on the conference and worked with me in this field. Trudy Huskamp peterson Perrine Canavaggio, Jens Ball, and um, Antonio Gonzalez. There are many, many more as well. I think their contribution to the international archives world is very profound, and I salute it. I hope this discussion will go well. I hope that uh, delegates will uh, engage and take this debate further over the next 20 years. I would like to conclude with the remarks of Archbishop Desmond Tutu. No one, mercifully, can be found who ever supported apartheid. Wonderful. We are ashamed of that part of our history, but it is our history nevertheless. And it stands there in our national archives to remind us of the awfulness we survived and of which we were capable. The records are indispensable as deterrents against a repetition of this ghastliness. They are a potential bulwark against human rights violations. I don't think I could put it better than that. Thank you and good luck to all of you. First, we would like to thank Graham Domini for sending us this video and especially for giving us uh, like the, the context of this important uh, moment in the history of ICA and I must say in the history of the, of the cattle sector. So now that we have the context, we can uh, continue uh, 
um, the discussion. Uh, we will have um, the the first presentation that will come from Trudy Haskam Peterson. Um, I'm sure many of you know her. She has spent 24 years with the U.S. National uh, Archives, like including two years as active archivist of the United States. Um, but after retiring, she continued being very active. She's the, one of the, she was the founding executive director of the Open Society Archives in Budapest, in Hungary, uh, and also the director of archives and records management for the United Nations High Commissioners for Refugees. Um, Trudy has worked uh, as consultant for, for many different uh, um, projects and situations around the world. She has worked with the through commissions in South Africa and Honduras, also with the Nuclear Claims Tribunal of the Republic of the Marshall Islands. And we must highlight one of her uh, many publications called Final Acts, A Guide to Preserving the Records of Through Commissions. So please, uh, through the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Carlos. It's a great pleasure to do this uh, talk for the 20th anniversary of the section and the 75th anniversary of ICA itself. Um, I've been asked to do a little bit of history. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to do a little bit of uh, world history on human rights. Then I want to talk a little bit about truth commissions and tribunals and end with some special problems that I see today. Now, modern human rights discussions usually begin with the 1948 um, adoption by the UN of the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. The same year ICA was founded. Seems like a good pair to me. Uh, it's important to realize that this is the Universal Declaration. It is not a UN Declaration. It was set up to be a Universal Declaration on Human Rights. And everything looked quite promising, perhaps, on the human rights front, but then the Cold War came. And for all practical purposes, not much of significance happened for the next 30 years or so. We also had dictatorships in uh, Latin America, which were very severe. And so what happens then is in the latter part of the 80s, we start to see a renaissance of issues on human rights that people are willing to discuss. The Inter-American Commission on Human Rights is established and the Inter-American Court on Human Rights is established. This is important for a couple of reasons. First of all, Latin America had issued a declaration on human rights before the Universal Declaration. Not by much, it's the same year if I remember correctly, but it was first. And what happens then is the post-dictatorship governments in South and Central America agree to uh, have a dual uh, institution, one a commission, which acts a lot like an investigating judge, if you will, and a court. And you can have uh, cases referred to the court from the commission. Now, the commission takes uh, inquiries principally from governments, but you can also get to the commission as individuals. So it begins to open up the issue of human rights for individuals in the Latin American context. We then have seen, of course, the European Court of Human Rights, but again, during the Cold War, it was really uh, very stymied in what it could do. It has uh, come into being very important in the past 30 years. But when the Cold War was on, it was not particularly uh, a strong court on human rights. We also see at the end of the Cold War in 1993, which is another important date, we're 30 years out, there was the Vienna Conference of States Parties and they agreed to establish the, what is now today, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. And so suddenly in 1993, we begin to have a UN office that can investigate, 
we have uh, the commission and court in um, uh, the inter-American context and things begin to evolve. So at that same time, in the late 80s, early 90s, we see the rise of truth commissions. Graham has just talked about the importance of the truth commission in South Africa. But we had truth commissions in Guatemala, we had a truth commission in El Salvador, we had truth commissions in uh, Argentina, we had truth commissions uh, in many places in the world that you wouldn't really think of. Sri Lanka had one and so on. And so as these develop, there have been about, there have been more than 40 of them by now. And when I looked at them in 2005, there had been 20. We've about doubled. Uh, and one of the things that's very interesting about the truth commissions is they almost always begin by using records of non-governmental organizations. It's very hard usually for truth commissions to get records of governments to begin. Not always true, but pretty generally it's hard to get government records. And so the records of non-governmental organizations and individuals became critically important to start looking at human rights violations especially violations during periods of dictatorship and other uh, repressive regimes. Um, we also see that because of that, the um, section on archives and human rights has long been involved in uh, trying to figure out what to do about records of truth commissions. Yes, I wrote the early book on it, but as Antonio, I'm sure will tell you, there's a lot of work that still has to be done and the section is doing it. Now, at the same time, we see the rise of truth commissions. We see increased demands for courts, for holding accountable senior officials who are responsible for some of the worst human rights violations. There's been an international court of justice for decades, but that's when one country sues another country. Uh, and this was a case that became very important when the wars in the Balkans broke out in the 90s. And people looked back at the Nuremberg tribunals and said, those never went forward. People had thought before the Cold War came down that maybe out of Nuremberg, we would get an international uh, regime of justice. Didn't happen. And so once the Balkan Wars are breaking out, there is a real look back toward Nuremberg and to see what can we do uh, to punish the people who have brought this disaster on a number of countries and hundreds of thousands of people. And so the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia was set. At the same time, we have the genocide in Rwanda. And so the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda is set up. Now these are independent courts. They are funded separately. Uh, a lot of times is spent fundraising among governments and other donors to try to get these courts set up. Once again, it becomes difficult to get the uh, records of government uh, for those courts. And so you see other sources other archives being pulled in to be used. And we start to see the rise of the use of uh, media, of all kinds of media, whether it's television, recordings, um, the uh, International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda relied heavily on radio broadcasts that were captured and that were seen to be a start of the push toward the genocide that happened. These two courts were truly international courts. They were set up and basically the UN uh, was responsible. Then we had the genocide in Cambodia and we had the horrible wars in Sierra Leone and Liberia. And so a new model was suggested, which would be a mixed court, which would have prosecutors and judges from the country in question, but also internationals to try to balance out uh, 
internal victor's justice, let's be honest about it. And so the extraordinary chambers of the courts of Cambodia was set up that has just ended its work. It is in a three year close down period right now. Then we also had the uh, special court for Sierra Leone, which was basically adopting the model of the Rwanda court, another African court, but had again the mix of local judges, local prosecutors and investigators, along with internationals. Well, what starts to happen is people say, ah, oh, this isn't really working. We can't keep setting up these different courts and we can't keep funding them separately. Let's get something that is big, that really responds to all these cases. And so the movement was for the international, what is today the International Criminal Court, which celebrated its 20th anniversary of the Rome Declaration last year. And we had a session at the ICA in Rome on the importance of the International Criminal Court and the importance of archives in those cases. I thought at that time, and I think many other people did, that this was going to be sufficient and we were not gonna see continued truth commissions. We were not gonna see continued uh, criminal courts. I was wrong. A lot of other people were wrong. Uh, there are real limitations to the uh, cases that the International Criminal Court can take. In part, a, it's a time uh, line. They can't take cases before uh, 2002 when they were established. And they're, it's very difficult for them to take cases of countries that were not members or had not joined the court. And unfortunately, we've got some really big countries like my own United States, which are not members of the court, neither is Russia, neither is China. And so we have a series of difficulties in getting cases to open at, at the court because of this. The uh, Security Council of the UN can itself refer cases to the court, but again, because of the power structure involved in the Security Council, that's very difficult as well. So what we have seen then is we have seen a special court set up for Lebanon and it has run out of money. It is in abeyance right now. We have a special court going on for Kosovo, which uh, is still in progress. There have been now questions raised. Should we have a special court over the conflict in Ukraine? A lot of work has been done. Uh, in trying to put together evidence for such a court, but no establishment has been made. Uh, the horrible war in Sudan right now has also called for questions of, should there be a special court for Sudan? Uh, again, no decision, no uh, backing for such a thing. In the process though, of getting these kinds of inquiries on the table, we've seen this, start of a new thing from the United Nations, in part from the United Nations itself, in part from the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, and that is special investigative mechanisms. Uh, the big one on Syria is called the International Impartial Independent Mechanism on Syria, and it has been collecting information on the bloody conflict in Syria in case some tribunal is set up. There are uh, efforts to do the same thing for Ukraine. Uh, there was a very important one on Sri Lanka. Uh, and so we begin to see these bodies collecting information, stockpiling it, if you will, in case some international tribunal does occur there will be evidence to be used. With that, let me turn to the problems. And the problems I think are really two. One is we've never established an international archives for all the courts. We've said the UN has to take care of the records of the international uh, court for Yugoslavia and for Rwanda because those were UN courts. But now we have, let's tick them off. 
Sierra Leone, uh, Cambodia, Lebanon, Kosovo, and suddenly these are special kinds of records. These are records that are going to have continuing legal demand. And so we have not figured out what we're going to do with them. Truth commissions, we tend to say, they ought to stay in the country involved. They're the country's records. They've got to take care of them. But the international courts are different. And we haven't really made any decision. And yet we've got an enormous accumulation of records and tremendous importance, not only to the countries involved, but internationally. The Sierra Leone conflict was not Sierra Leone. It was Sierra Leone and Liberia. The Kosovo conflict is a Balkan conflict. The Lebanon one is a Middle Eastern conflict. This is the history of those regions. And we are ignoring what we need to do to make sure those records are preserved and available. The second thing is that we have not funded adequately the UN archives or the archives of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. These are both overwhelmed by volume they are in need of money and additional staffing. They have special access issues that they must address because they are dealing with current problems, current access issues. And so I'd say that we in the international archival community have a responsibility to raise our voices and say that these international human rights bodies, the international courts, need to be cared for and need to be preserved under archival management and made available as needed to interested parties and ultimately to the historians of the countries around the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rudy. Uh, thank you for this very complete uh, historical review and especially for showing us that the evolution of human rights and, and the relationship with, between archives and human rights is not like a one way road, but like a set of different uh, parallel roads uh, and that and, to, and showing us also that how difficult it is to, to, to establish and how fragile it, fragile it is and how difficult it is to establish a, a coordinated system or like harmonized system of, of, of these different true commissions and, and courts. Um, our, uh, um, first, I would like to invite the, um, the participants to, if they have questions, they can, uh, you can start writing them um, in the section uh, for that. Um, in the bottom of the screen, you can see an icon for, for the chat of questions and answers. So please start writing your questions so, so we can start selecting them for, for the moment of uh, the discussion. So to continue with the, uh, with the presentations, now we have uh, Antonio Gonzalez Quintana. Uh, he was Deputy Director General of, Arca, of the Archive in the region of Madrid between 2010 and 2018. Uh, but previously, he was the director of the Information Center on Archives of the Ministry of Culture. He was the head of the coordination unit of military archives of the Ministry of Defense and the director of the Civil War Archives in, in Salamanca. Uh, he has also published uh, several books, and especially, um, related, especially related to the labor movement, or on records for the study of the civil war and franquism. Uh, so please, Antonio. Thank you very much, Carlos. Thank you, all the audience for, for hearing us and, and to be with us in this uh, 75th anniversary of the International Council on Archives and also the 20th century of, of our section, because the working group born in Cape Town, as uh, has remembered. I'm very happy for this, and I would like to share with you some some comments on the on the real uh, challenges uh, we we have in front of us. What we need to face? Uh, we need to face 
old challenges not still uh, solution it uh, as uh, Trudy has comment uh, in the case of the commission's archives or the archives of the criminal courts, international criminal courts, but much others that I, I would like to, to mention of challenges that continue being there for, for us and new challenges we may be, we, we need to, to face and that are many and, and are important also. It, um, it is at the, at the end of the, um, the 20th century, at the end uh, of the communist regimes in, uh, in, in Central and, and Eastern Europe, when the international community, uh, including archivists from the International Council of Archives, uh, in collaboration with UNESCO, set the challenge of uh, preserving and protecting the huge documentary legacy that uh, testifies the actions of the political police in these states, and making it accessible for the sake of those preparation and justice policies that have been grouped around the concept of transitional justice within the framework of the United Nations fight against impunity for crimes uh, against human rights. And it is also the point in which we can say that human rights started in 1993, irreversibly to incorporate uh, this issue in the Archivist agenda in the uh, Citra of Mexico in 1993. But this great archival challenge uh, has not been the first, this of the uh, records of the security services of the former representatives. It's not the first, not will be the last that societies have had to face throughout history to facilitate the exercise of peace and rights that since the dawn of its configuration at the end of the 18th century have been consolidating, although with downs and, 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 and ups yeah, and in waves uh, in the 19th and century uh, and 20th centuries. The old challenge of documenting uh, uh, personal identity, the challenge of, of um, support uh, the capacity to, to, to have a personality uh, uh, and identity uh, is, is the first one. Uh, uh, since the creation of the civil registry, civil rights and public records and archives have followed a parallel path in their development. It is not an exaggeration to say that the civil registry is the father of public archives. In this historical moment, we would place the for the beginning of the link between archives and political freedoms, and later between archives and uh, democracy. The old challenge of providing documentary support for citizens' rights that emerged at the end of the old regime continues, however, in the 21st century. We must refer in this sense to the uh, sustainable development goals of the United Nations uh, set in, in its uh, 2030 agenda. Thus, in the goal 16, promote justice, peaceful, and inclusive societies, we find the goal 16.9 uh, that it pursues by 2030 provide access to legal identity for all, in particular through birth registration. The fundamental challenge for the world of archives will therefore be at present to maintain and preserve birth records. And if there is no office and archives in the civil registry or registries of persons, we must create, they must be created urgently. We must uh, say that uh, in, in some countries, uh, especially in, in, in Africa, uh, there are um, a percent of um, uh, children without registry so huge 
that it facilitates a lot the traffic of people, of persons. And this is one of the reasons why uh, to limit this, this uh, very bad percent uh, in the future is, is one responsibility for the international community. To the, uh, I'm, I'm trying to pass my screen, but I don't know exactly how to do it. Uh, sorry. The second uh, challenge uh, that continues being here for us is that of preserving testimonies of human rights violations. And Tudi has talked about the preservation of the records produced by the commissions and uh, by international criminal courts, but also uh, we must refer to the records produced by the repressive bodies uh, themselves. Uh, as the security services of the former repressive regimes, police, military uh, forces, and, and so on, that in, in some countries have become to a, a, a very good solution, uh, putting all these records in special institutions, uh, very broad, very, very, very similar to the uh, institutions of transitional justice, uh, which are the federal uh, commissioner for archives of the Stasi in, in, in Germany in the first place, but uh, also in, in the Czech Republic, Slovakia, uh, Poland with the, the Institute of Memory, uh, Hungary, uh, Romania and Bulgaria have got this, this solution. But uh, we have this, this side of the, of the solution with a special institution putting the records at the service of the of the reparation, the justice, and uh, the memory. And uh, in the other side, we have many countries, for instance, in, in Latin America, where we continue knowing knowing nothing about the records of the uh, security services in the past or the police records. Uh, I can mention the, the example of, of Dina in, in Chile, the special police of, of Pinochet. We know nothing about the the legacy of the documentary legacy of this institution and in in latin america have been created uh, special institutions uh, in the world of archives archivo nacional de la memoria uh, in in argentina and uruguay the center for the national memory in colombia and, and others but they have not the corpse of the uh, most important records produced by the security services. So it, this continue being a, a, an issue to be resolved. Uh, the most important records produced by police or um, intelligence services in Latin America are those located um, by casualty, not uh, uh, occasionally, not, not by, by an effort or a policy or archival policy or memory policy. You know, the example of uh, Paraguay with the police of Stresner, uh, archive, archives of the police uh, produced by the Stresner dictatorship, and to Guatemala with the records of the old uh, national police. Besides these, uh, these challenges, we have all uh, the responsibility to, to preserve and use the records and archives produced by the uh, organizations of the civil society, community archives, NGOs, churches that have played a very important role in 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 the in the past uh, in the first years of transitions uh, the main mm, testimonies and evidences uh, aborted to the truth commissions as Trudy has uh, already mentioned came from these NGOs from churches at Vicaria de la Solidaridad in in Chile or project Brazil nunca más de la of, of the churches uh, in, in, in Brazil, different churches, uh, different religions, uh, and the community archives, the documents produced by uh, organizations of 
um, human rights uh, defenders and, and uh, other civilian organizations. It is very important to preserve these records and it's important to, to look for them from the uh, national uh, archive system, if it exists. If not, it is necessary a policy, a public policy of memory, a public policy of archives, a public archival policy that preserve not only the uh, records produced by the government or the uh, public bodies, but also by these communities and these organizations. These records are very important and they need support uh, from the, the public institutions. The building of a national archive system it's, is also a challenge for a lot of countries. Many countries in the world have not uh, an archival law, uh, a law of archives. They have not uh, an archival system uh, with uh, the infrastructures, the, the, the human resources, the budget, the, um, the plans, the, the mechanisms to, to make possible the the, the correct uh, records management and the preservation of those that must be selected for a long-term preservation in, in the future. We need legislation where it doesn't exist and we need infrastructures and human resources plans. Education and training in records management and archival science is also another uh, challenge. Many uh, countries have not at the university super studies on archival science. Uh, there is no plan at all for the uh, training of people who is already working in, in the world of archives and it is very important to, to have this in, in, in consideration. It is necessary to make a flexible records uh, bearing witness of human rights violations. Uh, obstacles in the access practice uh, must be break, must be broken, broken, sorry. Uh, usually the common legislation uh, with the exceptions for the access uh, in order to protect personal data or national security, make very difficult to access to those records in the hands of the security services, the information, uh, although they are in a new and democratic society. Uh, and this, uh, these barriers must be broken. Uh, we have some guidelines in order to, to do that as are the, the SWAN principles in order to configure clearly which documents must be restricted because of uh, security and national security and so on. But uh, the rest of the documents, the rest of records produced by these uh, institutions, uh, why? Why can be open to the, to the uh, public consultation? Uh, limits of national security obsession uh, must be established in order to, to make possible access to information, more in cases in which we are looking how some countries are doing steps back in order to uh, restrict the access to those records of national security, as has been the case in, in in France about the, the war in, in Algeria and in Africa and uh, about which uh, the, the International Council on Archives has made uh, uh, a statement uh, in order to reconsider these policies of coming back in the opening of, of archives and in the opening of accessibility to this kind of records. It's very important to make accessible records that be a witness of human rights violations. And this is 
Yeah, and it's another challenge to be win uh, super. Very important, the new challenges we, we must face. Uh, one of them is, of course, uh, this of uh, supporting human rights in the business world. Uh, we have talked about the uh, fight against impunity in the uh, in the wealth of political and civilian rights, uh, in the responsibility of countries and so on. But in the wealth of business, this fight against impunity is much more difficult because not always is a responsibility directly of the states, but it's a, a it's a responsibility of the own uh, enterprises and corporations. Uh, and in this sense, the international law of human rights uh, is not, uh, uh, has not a binding mechanism to apply the, the, the corporations to, to act with respect to, to human rights. I would like to talk just a minute about uh, the uh, this this challenge uh, of uh, incorporate archival and records uh, management policies into the business world. So that, from a perspective of respect and protection of human rights, this violation of political, civil, economic, social, and cultural rights in the productive, commercial, or financial activity is avoided both in the public entities in charge of monitoring protection of civil rights in the framework of economy, economic activity and in the companies themselves, records management principles must be incorporated that make it possible to verify that business performance complies with respect for human rights. The guiding principles for business and human rights of the United Nations also known as the RAGI principles, is a reference uh, in reference to, to the United Nations rapporteur, John Ruggi, uh, in charge of its preparation, constitutes a document of extraordinary value to guide business activity within the framework of respect for human rights. However, from the analysis of the archivists, they suffer from an important deficiency, and that is that there are no specific references to records management or archives within these principles. In 2017, the Archives and Human Rights Working Group of the International Council on Archives called attention at the Forum uh, um, uh, of Business and Human Rights of the United Nations to the absolute absence of references in RAGI principles uh, to uh, records or archives uh, or to a uh, um, records management system. As in the uh, aforementioned principles on the right to know or in the right to true, the archives and records mm, mm, that make them up are essential uh, in this uh, state's surveillance task in the policies that companies must implement and in the repair mechanism. In short, in the three aspects that the principles contemplate, the three pillars. It was emphasized that the application for such principles inexcusably requires records to first offer objective elements to assistance or of assistance to states in their responsibilities of surveillance, provide means of proof for the companies themselves to endorse conduct that is committed to human rights and to deal with possible lawsuits that may be received in accordance with the reparation mechanism. Allow social organizations and victims to resort to supporting documents in their complaints and claims. They seen a couple of action to implement the principles in each country and company. The role of records and archives in the defense of human rights may be equally consistent in the electronic environment. This is 
another very important challenge, maintaining and improving the potential of archives and documents for strengthening of democracy in the defense of human rights in the digital world is one of the main challenges that the new archival paradigm poses. The public authorities face it with the, with the challenge, with the challenge must guarantee that the enormous advantages that electronic administrations can provide for greater efficiency, agility, and the transparency of their actions will not, in any case, undermine the democratic achievements consolidated in the recent years in terms of preservation, preservation and availability of public records, and consequently, in their use by citizens as fundamental tools for the exercise of their rights. If the, if the advantages offered by the electronic records for the democratic strengthening of societies are unquestionable, but the risk involved in the use of the new technologies are also, also evident. The main concerns of human rights defenders in the face of technological advances in, in information and communications can be summarized in two. First, the vulnerability of communications and the surveillance capacity for that public or economic powers can exercise over people, which threatens both the right to freedom of expression to the extent that our communication may be violated and the right to privacy and intimacy. Uh, this is a connection very important because we are hearing now to talk a lot about the right to be forgotten and the right to the protection of personal data. Uh, uh, as the opposite to the openness and the, the right to know and the right to true. And I remember that it, it was Louis Joannet, the UN Rapporteur for the Fight Against Impunity, the creator uh, of the right to know and the right to truth, uh, is the same person who made the first uh, international reports on the risks of using and abusing technologies in uh, the protection of privacy and the protection of personal data. Uh, in 1994, after the creation of the Office uh, of the High Commissioner, as uh, mentioned by Trudy, uh, in 1994 was uh, created the policy of fight against impunity and was uh, uh, Joanne the, the responsible for that. But in the Tehran conference in 1968, it was also Louis Jeanne, the responsible as reporter of the United Nations of creation of a policy of protection of personal data against the risk of technologies. So it is not, it's not opposite, are different parts of the, the international uh, human rights included in the declaration that what we must protect and in the protection of this uh, uh, human rights included in the declaration, archives have a lot to do in all of the cases. I would like to finish with a, a reference to a, a last uh, challenge that I, I would like to comment. There are much more. Carlos was talking about uh, the new collectives uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a dangerous situation, vulnerability uh, situation uh, as the refugees, as the, the children uh, under uh, uh, custody of mm, mm, public administrations uh, and 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 many other collectives that uh, that need uh, uh, the support and the, the help of also the, the records and archives to to prove their, their rights. But uh, mm, as a colophon, I would like to to talk about 
the the role of archivists and the role of um, records managers. Uh, we have a lot to do in this, and we have also a risk to 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 follow because we we know just in these days and 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 is in the web of the ICA the statement made by the organization in support of, of GAM, Grupo de Apoyo Mutuo, and its archive. Uh, GAM is a Guatemalan organization of the civil society, the, the most important uh, association of victims that is uh, working for justice for a long time, more than 30 years, and they are now accused by, uh, uh, by the structures of the of the of the public ministry and justice in, in, in Guatemala that are very criticized by the own uh, High Commissioner of Human Rights and the um, Special Rapporteur on, on the Independence of Justice, uh, accused now of being producing uh, false documents, false records that are used in the um, uh, uh, in the denounces against uh, former military leaders, uh, former policy uh, responsible, police responsible, and uh, other persons who are now attending uh, trials in, in Guatemala, trials that uh, some sections of the power would like to stop immediately and to revolt the question. So, People working with archives, not, not always archivists, but responsible of archives in the civil society or in the government. We must remember also in Guatemala, the former director of the, the uh, National Police uh, Historical Archive uh, has a, a, a warrant uh, of detention and an order uh, from a uh, uh, judge in, in Guatemala and, uh, and is persecuted. Uh, mainly because during uh, his responsibility, he offered records to the Yassi the from the archive, not as a person, as uh, the institution uh, in, in the process uh, of the so-called Diario Militar or Efraín Rios Mon or uh, Edgar Fernando Cartilla or, or, or others. Uh, so we have to risk, but we have producers in the section uh, in the past, a document that is the basic principles on the role of archivists and uh, records managers in support of human rights, in which we we offer some suggestions on how to deal with this risk and how to deal with the responsibility of um, of of making known the existence of records and documents that prove the a violation of human rights. And I think because of this involvement, not only of the section of archives and human rights of the International Council on Archives, but also uh, organizations of Archivists Without Borders, uh, Swiss Peace, uh, and, and, and many others, uh, we will reflect the commitment of the profession in the defense of human rights, and we have got some recognition. The camp has now recognition uh, by a, a very important uh, international uh, body in, in, in Latin America, and also the section was recognized in 2020 uh, by the uh, Spanish uh, Human Rights Association with the international award that we have here. I must, I must bring to, to the Paris offices in, in any moment. And here is, is, is difficult, but it's important our role, and uh, I invite all activists around the world uh, to join us in this in this fight in this uh, commitment in the defense of human rights thank you very much thank you very much antonio especially for highlighting uh, the importance of the variety of records that are necessary or needed for safeguarding um, human rights when we were talking about uh, security service, civil society uh, records and archives, and also for highlighting all the, the, the challenges that archivists and archives are facing nowadays, and also this, like this environmental rights that now 
uh, we are all involved in, in, in defending our, in preserving. And so there is a role that we need to be discussed uh, in, uh, in the sector. Um, we can now uh, start the discussion. I see that uh, Graham Domini is now connected. Um, so thank you again for the video you sent us. And if you want, please feel free uh, to participate in the conversation. Uh, and I also invite uh, Perrine to jump in uh, whenever she wants, so we can all have a, a very interesting conversation. I will start with one question, and it's about the main difficulties um, of raising awareness uh, about the importance of safeguarding archives uh, for, for defending the, the uh, human rights, especially within civil society. And I'm giving you an example. We, we have seen sometimes uh, when there are protests from the civil society, they see, for example, the national archive or the governmental archives, they are seen as part of the government they are protesting against. Um, and sometimes we see that they are in danger because they don't know that in many cases, in most of cases, that the information that is there is very important for, 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 for defending the human rights. So I would like to know what is the, the, main, the main challenges about raising awareness within civil society about the, the importance of archives and records. Antonio, I think that's your question. Yeah, sorry, but I, 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 I couldn't uh, understand all, all, all okay. Uh, if, if you may summarize, please, uh, Carlos. Yeah. I can I can repeat this. That sometimes we feel that civil society is not always aware of the importance of records and archives uh, for the safeguarding of human rights. So, what are the main challenges, or what can we do to to raise awareness on that? So we avoid that in the case, like in the context of protests, members of the civil society can even harm or destroy. Uh, archives or records. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, I think it's it's a, uh, it's a very difficult uh, question to answer with a, with a simple um, answer uh, because it's true that usually people only um, uh, things in in in, in records and archives when they need uh, a paper, when they need uh, a certificate, when they need some uh, kind of proof or kind of um, evidence. To, to do any uh, any action uh, in in tribunals and trials or in an administrative process, uh, in this case in transitions, uh, it's very clear that people uh, is is ready to support uh, um, public policies uh, in the world of, of archives, archival policies, because they know that it's important to preserve these records because they need to prove their condition at least as victims, they need to prove the, the crimes committed and they need proofs. Uh, in a society who, which has ended a uh, long time ago, a period of this one, this, this, um, this, this effort to convince uh, the society of the need, uh, of the need to, to preserve records is much more difficult. And sometimes, is, is a high uh, fight uh, in different um, um, political positions in front of. In Spain, uh, for instance, uh, that we continue with a lot of disappeared people in the, in the countryside and, and, and we have very many things to resolve. We must have also in account that uh, the dictatorship finished more than 40 years ago. So a long time has passed and many people didn't leave any of these processes in the transition of the first moments in the country. And it's difficult to convince them about the importance of these uh, public policies. And it's easy for the opponents to, to say, this is a, a very bad uh, expenditure of money. We don't need to do all these things. It's not. A, and I think the only solution for that is the education programs and uh, the, uh, the fight against the uh, 
the forgetting uh, of the society as a whole. And the public policies of memory are important. The symbolic uh, actuations are important. Uh, and uh, the consensus, the social consensus is also important. And I, th and I think only through the education, the consensus is, is, is possible, but it's difficult, uh, I think. Perhaps through the union, you can say anything else. Be a little more optimistic. I think that as we move through this information society phase, that people are beginning to see how important information is and how easily it disappears. And as we can show that we are people who preserve information that is critical, we are not part of the disappearing of information. Um, I have some hopes that in the information society, the role and importance of archives is uh, going to be um, recognized. And so I'm a little more optimistic. Right. Antonio, you mentioned education. So I will jump to one of the questions of, uh, of one of our participants. Um, this participant is asking, is like from promoting and applying archives perspectives, how do you combine human rights with education effectively? And I think we can um, we can address this question in two angles, from two angles. Like first one is the education uh, for archivists, but also the education for all other related uh, disciplines. So how do you think we can tackle this? Uh, this challenge? Well, I, uh, I think continuing with, um, with the, uh, the previous uh, question, that uh, it's important at school, at the um, all levels of education, uh, in, in the first years, uh, um, at least of the secondary education, I think it's necessary to talk about the uh, importance of uh, records and archives and the importance of knowing uh, about the past with with good sources uh, and with uh, sources in which we can rely on and, and, and be confident and, and we trust uh, in them and archives may give this this kind of, uh, of warranties uh, it's important to know about archives and records administration and records management in the school, uh, in the secondary school at least, is, is my opinion. But of course, we also need a training program for, for archivists. We need to change uh, the basis of the uh, traditional uh, education at university of archivists in this auxiliar mm, uh, sciences of paleography, diplomacy, and uh, archival science, and so on, and also to have a very important, a strong perspective from the legal uh, point of view, uh, laws, uh, education in law, education on human rights, education on international institutions, education in uh, international compromises and, 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 and commitments. So uh, also, mm. as uh, my, my last uh, suggestion, uh, the creation of code of ethics or new code of ethics uh, as the basic principles can be part of, of them uh, besides our mm, former and old uh, Code of Ethics created in 1996 in, in Beijing, I think are important, important for the association. Many associations in ICA have uh, endorsed the basic principles as a part of their ethical uh, commitment. And, and I think this, this is important uh, to promote training programs with uh, reference to law and uh, human rights, and also uh, face the renewing of um, our codes of ethics, uh, taking this this perspective of protection of human rights also. Antonio, you uh, remind me to say that I would very much like to see 
uh, associations of archivists and archival institutions around the world adopt the basic principles on the role of archivists and records managers in respect of human rights. We have some uh, organizations that have adopted it um, in Latin America, in the United States, in some parts of Europe, I think in Spain. Spain yeah. I'd like to see a lot more associations take a hard look at that document and say, yes, this, this is what we also believe and, and take it up. Um, let me also say that I think that as the debate over false information goes forward, uh, the whole debate over what's now called uh, chat GDP uh, and how does one distinguish fake information from real information uh, goes forward. We're going to see that in universities. And we have a role to play in speaking up and talking about what is a true document and how do you look at a document and understand its truthfulness or its untruthfulness. And I think that will be incredibly important in the uh, coming years as the information age starts to come to grips with fake information. Yeah. Can I add something? Uh, I, I absolutely approve what uh, Antonio said. Uh, given my experience in uh, in this preparation of citras, I discovered that uh, we have to go outside the profession. Uh, it is a it was especially the case with uh, human rights. Uh, the first thing we did in, in, in uh, when we created the the group, the working group in Cape Town, the first thing we did was to contact Louis Joannet, and we wrote together an article in Le Monde. And it was an introduction. It, it, it was just, a, how do you say that, a start, a starter, a starter. But we, we, we can do a lot of things locally with the, the radio, the broadcast, TV, because people, the, the, all the, the, the directors uh, use archives, but people are not aware. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of, um, of opportunities. People, uh, the society has a patrimonial vision of archives, and we have to show that we are, this is the proof, but who is attending our uh, first Tuesday talk? Mainly archivists. We have to, to, ma to, to make publicity for this. Now that you are talking a little bit about the history of the of, of the section. Um, maybe you can also tell us a little bit about the the beginning of the of, of the working group and that, that that is now a section. And first, what were the main difficulties you faced at that moment, and what what were the the, the opportunities that that you took and that you profit from uh, to make this like to have the the power that after 20 years we we, we can see now the the impact of this of this initiative uh, we, that started in 2003 in the beginning we uh, uh, yes we we one we discovered in Cape Town as Graham recorded it the fabulous uh, potential of this theme the theme, the link, because the link between archives and, and human rights has, has not been uh, the theme of an international conference until Cape Town. It has been used in Latin America, but for uh, local colloquiums. And it was the first time, and it was very difficult to have this time, uh, in, at this time, 20 years ago, to have this theme adopted uh, within ICA, because as you know, ICA is a universal uh, uh, world uh, organization. So it was only possible because of uh, Graham uh, hosting, because of uh, the, the Truth Commission uh, archives transferred to the National Archives, and because of Desmond Tutu. And there was a dynamics, and I remember we worked together with Antonio and Jens on the preparation of the resolutions 
and we decided not to put the resolutions in a, how do you say, a tiroir, uh, okay, uh, down, sure. under sure. the carpet, but to, to, to make them effective. And it was very easy. It was very easy because everything, you, you agree, Antonio, you agree. We, we did not face difficulties. On the contrary, we, we, we start, the first thing we did was also to, to write a manual for NGOs because it was, it, it seemed, it seemed in that time uh, a priority uh, because they are isolated. But this is also something to do to, to update it because it was done in 2005 uh, and the world is changing very quickly. Okay. Antonio, I'm sure you can complete that. Maybe they, they can also answer at the same time. Is um, I mean, one of the questions of the participants is related to Guatemala, but that I think we can, we it can be applied to to, to many countries and situations. Is like how ICA. I mean, we see what happened 20 years ago, but how today how ICA can contribute to to safeguard documentary heritage, especially in relation to the defend. The, the, the defending of democracy, yeah, it's like what I think it's a it's a good opportunity a opportunity to show what the section is doing, what ICA is, is doing or can do for that. Carlos, if you let me um, about the question of of Constanza Cunha from Guatemala uh, or about Guatemala, I don't know exactly. Uh, of course, uh, the answer is uh, that uh, ICA has been involved in, uh, or if not as a whole, at least as a, uh, with some of the, the, the members, uh, Trudy has participated uh, in the beginning of the recovering and in a continuity of activities of the uh, National Historical Archives of the National Police in Guatemala, uh, also other colleagues uh, from the United States and from Europe, uh, Archivists Without Borders, uh, with many colleagues have also participated in this. Uh, I have also participated in Guatemala in, in some in some moments uh, with uh, with PNUD or other agencies of United Nations in order to to help archives to 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 continue with this with this task. And it's the same in other countries where we can where we can cooperate or when we we can find the facilities. Perhaps this is not the case of Palestine, and I and I try to answer another of the questions now. And and it's important to have it into account also and 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 to take a present. But but we have been working in, in Lebanon or, or in other places in in the Middle East. So it is not easy to to be and to stay in all places in all countries. But um, but we would like to take. A, a, a big number of, section, uh, of, of, of institutions and uh, individual members in uh, in our in our section in order to help us in in this in this task. Also, uh, another question I would like to mention is a question made by um, is important Ya uh, Chuli about the uh, illustration progress and the question of access to records of uh, security services. And I think it's very important in Europe because of course, sometimes these records have been used uh, following the guidelines of the new intelligence services and not always in a very clear way. Uh, and with a lot of critics about the use and abuse of the illustration progress, it's important, but this is in front of the other situation in Latin America where no processes at all of illustrations have taken place. Never has uh, the records produced by security services used in an illustration process in Argentina, Paraguay, Uruguay, or any other countries with a huge and long dictatorship in the past. I think it's important also to recognize in many cases, national archivists are sort of stuck. Um, they are going to lose their job if they are too aggressive on a human rights front. Um, on the other hand, they're going to get people like us pushing at them. So they're, they tend to be in a difficult position. Ultimately, I think the thing that ICA can do 
is stand outside the circle of national governments and try to say these are some universal principles. This is an important uh, institution in every country. Um, do publicity, uh, provide those kinds of tools, but um, national archivists are gonna have to mediate and, and be in that middle between the people like us who are pushing on one side and their governments who are maybe not gonna be happy about that idea. Um, so I certainly started doing the um, ICA section news because we had national governments at least talking to me and saying, um, this is criticism of us. And I wanted to make sure that people understood that the human rights issue, as Antonio has said, is an issue in business. It is an issue in religious bodies. It is an issue right. for NGOs of all kinds. And so it is not directed solely at national governments. It is an issue that we need to push uh, across the board and ICA has to stand outside that tricky national government uh, area. I will invite all of the speakers to give uh, to make a fi uh, some fi like final remarks because we are close to the end but before that I would like to 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 read the the comment that Graham Domini uh, wrote in, in the chat um to when we were talking about uh, training and education so he says that he says I agree with Antonio's point about training of archivists in addition to what he's saying future archivists are going to need to master the control of massive electronic databases. Too much information affecting the rights of citizens or the treatment of non-citizens exists and is maintained in government or financial, financial institutions. And what exists on paper is a pale reflection of the information that is kept on people. Uh, so before finishing, please, uh, I invite you to, to, to make some final remarks and then we will have for the announcements. Please, uh, Antonio. Uh, Carlos, if you, if you let me, uh, there is a question from Kolya Abramsky that uh, we have not answered, and perhaps it's not uh, um, a question for, for me or for Trudy, um, is perhaps more a question for, for you, Carlos, about the decision uh, taken by uh, ICA, uh, a year ago uh, of suspending Russian and Belarusian uh, archives agencies, national agencies, they remember not archivists of Belarus or archivists of, of, of Russia from uh, ICA. Uh, from my part, I would only say that uh, um, I don't know exactly the reasons to take this decision, but I think uh, that it's difficult to maintain within an institution uh, those organizations who break the rules of uh, its own constitution. Uh, this is the protection of records and uh, archives. And we must remember that the, the Russian administration, I talk in this case only about Russia, uh, suspended memorial and uh, declared uh, out of the law this institution, an institution with a long tradition in the creation and protection of records and archives regarding the violations of human rights in, in Russia. And also that these agencies are taking sized records in another country, as is Ukraine. And I think these are a very, a very, very big mistakes in order to, uh, to use the, the, the way to act of the agency of the Federal Archives in, in Russia. This is my opinion, of course. I get uh, yep. two sentences. I believe firmly that access to archives empowers people and that we must remember that all these things happen among us. Thank you, Trudy. Uh, Karin, you want to say something? Uh, no, 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 just uh, remind that it's a collective work and it's fantastic. We have a fantastic network. Uh, maybe I can announce the next uh, first Tuesday talk. Uh, the, the, next, the two next uh, talks will be in Spanish. One on, uh, in August, it will be uh, 
dedicated to the, the archives of the Truth Commission, and we will have two people uh, working for this commission. And in, uh, in October, we will have uh, Guatemala, the Grupo de Apoyo Mutual. Uh, this is absolutely uh, uh, the actuality. Thank you. And of course, you can find uh, all these uh, talks on the, 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 can, uh, the YouTube channel, the ICA YouTube channel. Uh, yeah, and please remember that this is just the, the second webinar of this International Archives Week. Tomorrow we have two webinars, uh, one uh, with all uh, the sections that is like addressing the, especially our African members to, to know a little bit more what they do and what how can, can they participate more actively. So if you are interested, please join. And we also have um, another webinar uh, with ALA uh, celebrating the 50, uh, the 50 years of the creation of this uh, regional branch. So we have a lot of anniversaries this year. Uh, so please uh, join us and continue being connected like during the International Archive Week, uh, the Tuesday talks, and of course, all the other activities. Um, to wrap up, I would like to thank again all the, the, the speakers and Graham Domini for, for his participation um, with, with his video and, and in the chat. Antonio, Trudy, Perrin, thank you very much. And uh, I'm sure this one, this we will continue doing this, uh, having these conversations. I, I have, I'm reading the comments from the participants, and they are they are quite happy. So thank you very much, and thank you, of course, to all the members of the secretariat who participated in the organization of of this of this uh, webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carlos. And see you soon. I hope. <laughs> Bye. Bye.